So Genesis chapter 2, turn your Bibles there. And I want to start off with a, a silly joke. It definitely is not uh, theologically sound, <laughs> but I think that you'll get a, a, at least a little chuckle out of it. One day Eve was walking in the garden with the Lord, and she said, Lord, the garden is wonderful, and the animals, the birds uh, provide such joy, but I'm still lonely. No problem, the Lord replied. I'll make you a man for your companion. He will desire to please you and be with you. But I have to warn you, he won't be perfect. He'll have a difficult time understanding your feelings. Uh, we'll tend to think, uh, he'll tend to think that uh, only, he'll, he'll tend to think only of himself and will stay out late with his bowling buddies. Eve asks, what's bowling? He says, oh, never mind, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> That's okay. I think I can handle the man, Eve replied. Great, I'll get right to it. And God said he started grabbing some mud, shaping it, and suddenly the Lord stopped and said to Eve, oh, there's one more thing about this man that I'm making for you. What's that, Eve said. Uh, you'll have to tell him that he was made first. <laughs> right? <clears throat> I know, just a little chuckle. Some of you might get it. You'll, you'll start laughing in a couple of minutes, right? <laughs> uh, definitely not theologically sound, because we know the Bible says that man was created first, and then woman from his side, and we'll see that tonight in, in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, question, if Genesis is the book of beginnings, how important is the beginning of this book? It's very important. These two chapters that we have been dealing with built, really build our faith in God. This is where it all began. This is where we need to put our faith and trust in our Creator as God and as above all things. We can ask any question about life and the answers are in these two books, these two chapters here. It doesn't matter what that question is, you will find it here. You can ask a question on why do we have you know, disease in the world. We come right back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, that there was no disease in the world until man sinned. Then disease came into the world. That's why we have disease. Why do we have evil in the world? Because God has given us free will. We make choices, and we all have that free will to choose or not to choose. God gives us that free will. He made us in His image. In fact, if you look at Verse 26 of chapter 1, it says, God said, let us make man in our image. Now up to this point in chapter 1, he gave us a br brief description of creation in six days, 24-hour periods, and he quickly gave us that creation on what God did. On the first day, God did this. On the second day, God did this. The third day, the fourth day, and fifth day, and on the sixth day, he created man. And he's telling us what he did, God. Then he comes to this verse and says, God said, let us make man in our image. Who's creating? God. Well, who's us? Who's us there, right? Because he says us. And someone noticed that last week, and I didn't bring it up, and so I wanted to bring it up uh, this week because there is just so much here. I really do wish that I could just really slow down and exhaust uh, just some thoughts here, but I know that I can't because we would be in Genesis for several years and I don't want to do that, but it definitely uh, is a good read for you and, and to study it and ask questions and, and find the answers out for yourself. But we have, let us make man our image. And he is talking about God. So he's talking about the triune uh, being here, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that they made man in their image. And one of the images of God is free will. God has free will. There's a word that we use, a theological word, it's called sovereign. God is sovereign. Uh, it's according to his will. He's going to do what he wants to do, whether you like it or not, because he's God and he knows past, present, and future. He knows how things will turn out. He already knows what tomorrow brings. Uh, he already knows the end, and he knows that he's victorious. He knows that the enemy will be sent into outer darkness. And if he knows all this, then we can trust him, that he is sovereign and he knows what he is doing. Yet he gives us that free will. So Genesis chapter 1 and 2 lay the foundation 
that are vital for our understanding of all life in itself. You know, like, what is God like? Where did we come from? Why are we here? Uh, why did God create marriage? You know, uh, who was first? Who was second? What is the responsibility of man? What is the responsibility of woman? Uh, what about chill? I mean, you can just go on and on and on, and the answer is all right here uh, in these uh, seven days of creation, 24-hour uh, periods of time. Let me break up chapter 2 in, into some bite sizes for you as we go through them. In verses 1 and 3, we're going to see God kind of work uh, all the works that He's doing here in creation. And He gives us definitely more details in chapter 2 than chapter 1. As I said last week, there's not a discrepancy. He's not changing uh, things around. Uh, the writer just gave us a brief description in chapter 1, and then he really gets in depth in chapter 2, and, and he gives us more details about each of the the periods of creation. And so we're going to see God resting in verses 1 and 3 when he finally rested on that day uh, from his work. And then chap uh, verse 4 through 6, he'll give us uh, other particulars concerning uh, creation. And then verse 7, he creates Adam again. Not again, but he talks about the creation of Adam itself. And then in 8 through 14, the planting of the garden in the world, that before the world was formed, there was no vegetation on it. And God literally creates the vegetation out of nothing, by the way. If you look at um, verse 27, chapter 1, it says, So God created man in his own image. And that word created there is the word bara, which means out of nothing. And so God literally takes nothing and he creates all of this because he's God and he can. In 15 through 17, man is placed in it and the tree of knowledge, which was forbidden for them to eat, which we'll see in chapter 3 that they do eat of it. And then verse 18, Eve becomes the helper of Adam. And then 19 through 20, we see the animals are, are literally named. God... Um, creates all the animals that should be created and he creates no more and there are no more that are created after that and he gives the responsibility to Adam to name them all. So quite a task for him uh, to figure out what animals should be named when you really think about it. Um, makes sense. Uh, we we um, get animals like a pig and then we give it a name, you know, though the name is Pig. I remember watching a, a, a movie with um, um, Robert Redford, and he was a farmer, and his granddaughter said, uh, what's your kitty's name? And he said, he doesn't have a name. What do you call it, kitty? <laughs> it's just a kitty, you know. Of course, that's a man, but uh, she immediately named him. So we, we see a pig, like in our house, and me, immediately Virginia says, Wilbur. So we have Wilbur, you know, in our house. Uh, Adam begins to name them. He sees a, an animal, and it's fat and round, and that's a pig. Looks like a pig, and so I'm going to name it a pig. Uh, he oinks, and he eats, and so, yeah, sounds like a pig. So he names them, and we'll see that. And then um, 21 through 25, as, as we see the institution of marriage itself. So even marriage here, there's a lot here on marriage, and I would, I'd really love to spend time there, but we just don't have the time. Let's go ahead and look at verses 1 through 3 as God works uh, to the end on the Sabbath day. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And so chapter 2 starts with the statement that God is done. It is finished. And the word finished there means finished. There's no more to do. Uh, what He created is all that He created. And there's nothing that is created after that. Well, wait a minute. So we have nothing new today than back then? Exactly. But we have things that are different. Well, yeah, within its kind, because we talked about that last week. Uh, he created a dog, and he created a male and female. And we'll see that when we get to Noah's story and how one of each kind come to the ark to preserve the animals uh, on the face of the earth. 
So he created a, a, a male and a female dog. What did those dogs look like? We have no idea. But they mated and they had other dogs. And those dogs mated and they had other dogs. And so you can just imagine after you know, hundreds of years of mating, you're going to have various kinds of dogs. But he created dogs and that was it. So it's finished. Uh, the word finished there is the same word that we find when Jesus is on the cross. And he said, it's finished, it's done, tostalistai, it is completed. And so a typology of Jesus on the cross when the sins were laid upon him, our sins, your sins, uh, our evilness and wickedness were laid there upon his shoulders and he said, Father, it is finished, it is done. It is I am the ultimate sacrifice and there is nothing more that needs to take place. There is no sacrament, there is no work, that needs to take place to better mankind. All they need to do is believe and have faiths of works towards God. And they have eternal life. It is finished. And so the, in the same way that when God created everything and finished it and it was done, the same way that God paid for our sins. It was done and paid for. And that should be exciting for us. We should have faith that God has paid for our sins. Now, the guilt, when we talked about this on a Sunday morning, the guilt of our sins. Now, we still sin, right? And, and when we sin, John tells us that God is faithful to forgive us of all our unrighteousness and to cleanse us from those sins if we confess them before him. And he forgives us. And so we can be reassured as Christians and believers in Jesus, understanding the whole salvation plan, understanding that we've given our hearts to him, and that we are now born again and we choose to serve him and surrender our lives to him. We choose to do that. And when we do that, we choose to have works of faith. Not just, yeah, I believe in him, but yeah, I have faith in him and I am doing things for him. That's the evidence of your faith. And Paul was clear in James. And so then we can walk on this, on this earth knowing that our sins are taken care of. They were done. They were complete. They were finished as it says in verse 1 then he goes on and says on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done so God rested now God didn't rest in the sense that you know whew, six days ah I created a lot of things I am really tired I need a break you know I need to just get away from all of this I need to go find a, a tree in the garden somewhere and just put my feet up and and just kind of oh it's kind of like what we do right when you know we work five days and we go oh I just need to rest for two days I gotta sleep in on Sunday because that's my day of rest and we get tired and we rest that's not what God is doing here when he says that he rested again in the sense that it's finished. There's no more to do. And so there is nothing else to do but to rest on that seventh day. Now the seventh day became the Sabbath day, the holy day. And the Jews were to keep that day uh, as a day of worship and praise to the Lord. And so it became one of the commandments of God in, in Exodus what chapter 21, where we are to keep holy the Sabbath day. And so we are to worship on Sunday, the Jews on Saturday, us Sunday because it's the first day of the week when Jesus resurrected from the dead. We set that day aside as believers in Christ Jesus as a tradition, not as a law. It is a tradition that we set aside Sundays. Sundays were created for us. It wasn't created for a law because Paul says that we should not judge one another on what day we worship. We can worship every day the Lord and have a Sabbath day. In fact, we should. And as Christians, we do because we understand that we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. We understand that we are His. We surrendered our lives to Him. And now we want to worship Him every day. His name is on our lips. His praises are on our lips. His thanksgivings are on our lips every day because we have a personal relationship with Him. So he rested, and so on the Sabbath day, we rest too. We come together, and like Paul said in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, 25, you know, do not forsake the gathering of one another. 
Whether that's a Sunday or a Wednesday or another day, we're not to forsake it. We should be uh, worshiping the Lord together corporately. We need to set that day aside. If you think about it, Sundays, I don't rest. I'm preaching. And I'm here in the morning and doing whatever I can and here usually till 1 o'clock or so. And so I'm not literally resting. So when is my rest day? Well, mine comes on different days when I set it aside for the Lord. So it's not necessarily the day, but we have chosen as Christians, and it is tradition that Sunday is that day. And, and as a nation, we obviously have chosen that because throughout the years of this nation, Sunday has always been the day that you go to church. I mean, you can go as far back as, as the, the beginning of this nation, and they set aside Sundays to go to church where the preachers would preach. And you'd go to the prairie little church out there and the preacher would get up there in his pulpit and he'd preach to the cowboys and the Indians, you know, on Sunday mornings. And so it is our tradition to do so. And so we set that aside as a remembrance that God rested on that day. It was finished. It was complete. Hallelujah. That's why we go and we praise him and glorify him that it is done. Then verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made so he rested uh, he sanctified it he set it apart uh, the word sanctified means set apart uh, simple word is the theological word sanctified and it means set apart or consecrated um, the, the simplest definition would be that we set it apart to do something righteous or holy McGee said that uh, you can have a ten dollar bill uh, out there in the streets a druggie could take that $10 bill and, and, and pay for some crack with it. And that guy would take that $10 bill and he'll roll it up and, and he'll taste that crack with that $10 bill too and then share it around. And that bill is pretty wicked and pretty evil, been passed around with, uh, by evil people. But somehow that $10 bill goes to Stater Brothers and someone then gives a $20 bill and he takes that $10 bill and then he goes to church on Sunday and he takes that $10 bill and he puts it in the offering. Now it's been sanctified. It's been set apart. Though it was evil, though it was used in the wrong way, but now that individual says, now I'm going to use it in the right way. I'm going to set it apart for something good. And he puts it in the tithe box, and now it goes for the work of the Lord. That's what sanctified means. You're set apart for something good. Each one of you are set apart for the Lord. Uh, he has called you to serve Him. As I said, um, James was very clear. If we have faith, we have works. Uh, Paul, <clears throat> Paul understood that, that we have works that have been prepared before the foundations of the world and we should walk in them. James understood that. <clears throat> Paul and James didn't contradict each other. They both agreed that we're saved by grace. But if we are saved and we have faith, then we'll have works too. In other words, we will have a, a hunger and a desire to serve God. It will be there. And then we need to make the choice to do it. That's our choice. Let us create them in our image. And that is free will. He creates them. So, <clears throat> now we come to uh, the next set of verses, 4 through 6. And we see some uh, uh, particular uh, things concerning creation in verse 4 it says this is the history of the heavens and the earth so now he gives us a detail verse verse 1 is thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts were and then we're finished but now he's going to describe some things for us so he gives us the history um, <clears throat> it's what the bible is right it's the history of god it's about his story and what he has done for mankind the story of israel a peculiar people that he called, the story of Jesus coming to this earth and then the story of the church today. It's history being unfolded before our very eyes. And so here's the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Verse 5, before any plants of the field was on, or in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. Uh, so before any plants and before any herbs were on the earth. So if you can imagine the earth without plants and without herbs, so pretty much bare, without anything. And so he's describing to us before he created these things, it's how the earth looked. Now what does that tell us? I mean, we can uh, 
come up with a lot of subjective ideas. You know, possibly, I, you know, I can possibly see that the earth may be billions and billions of years old. Can I say that? <laughs> and then God decides that on that first day, he's going to, because the earth was void, right? In chapter 1, it says the earth was void and without form. So it could have been for quite a while. Not that there were cavemen, not that there was evolution. It was just there. Nothing was on the earth. And then God all of a sudden decided, let's put things on the earth. And he says, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So there was no man on the earth, there was no one to till the ground, so why have vegetation, why have herbs on the ground? Uh, there was no rain that, that came on the earth. In fact, it says here that the mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. So the moisture came from the earth itself that went up. And that makes kind of a sense, isn't that what happens with with uh, rain, right? Was the clouds go over the ocean and it picks up the water and then it, uh, you know, comes over and it rains down into the land and then trickles from the mountains back down into the ocean. And it's just a cycle that God has created to water the earth. Still happens today. So that's the history before anything was created there. In verse 7, and there's a lot there that you can just, wow, scientifically look at that, right? And then we have verse 7 where God all of a sudden creates uh, Adam. And the Lord God formed man, and this is how he formed him, of the dust of the ground. And, and we know from science school that man, we are dust. We have the same elements as dust. And eventually if we die, our bodies will deteriorate and become dust. In, back into the earth. And so the Bible is not, you know, throwing some really outlandish ideas out there. It's very clear, and then science comes along and proves it, that we are just dust. So we're dust of the ground, and then it says, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So it was God who breathed into them, now, how did he do that? Some suggest that it necessarily wasn't, you know, uh, the type of CPR where he went up to the, the, the man that he had created and then breathed into him, but he just gave him the spirit and he came alive. That could be, it doesn't say, it just says that he breathed life into him. So however it was, man became a living being. And he became a living being because God breathed into him. And gave him life. Now we know that doesn't happen today, right? We are born now through the womb of our mothers. Uh, through Eve. From this point. So this was the origin of mankind. This is how the first Adam was created. From the dust of the earth and God gave him life. And then from that point on, life continued to this day. Where we have, what, six billion people on the face of the earth. That are the seed of, of Adam himself. A living being. Now, this thought here at the same time is that he was spiritually born again too. He was spiritually filled by the Lord. And so here he knows the Lord. And, and we'll see this later where he's walking in the garden with God. And so he knows God. He has a relationship with God. Uh, he's communing with God. He has commandments from God. Everything that we have here in our relationship with him. And he has the free will to choose to obey God and not obey God. And so he is a Christian, if we want to call him that, in the sense that, that he is a believer in God and has a relationship with him. Uh, remember, this is before the fall. I mean, this is the perfect state of man. This is a garden this was a creation that they could have lived forever. And if they had not sinned, we would all be a part of this perfect atmosphere, perfect environment in every sense of the word if they did not sin. But they did sin because they were created with free will. And we'll see that as they fall. So 
a type here, I guess in a sense, Jesus breathes what? The Holy Spirit into us, right? When, when we accept Jesus Christ into our lives, the Holy Spirit comes into us and he, he revives our spirit. So he awakens it. Without our spirit revived, we really have no understanding. That's why it's so hard for someone to understand the Bible, to understand truth, because their spirit is still dead. And I totally get that because my spirit was dead at one point. And, and so if uh, a person came up to me and said, hey, you need to believe in Jesus Christ, I'm like, yeah, you know, get out of here. I go to church. I know he died on the cross for me. I, I know all that. But I want to drink. I want to party. I want to take drugs. I want to enjoy life because everybody else is doing that. And so I did not understand the, full, the fullness of what Christ has done for me until all of a sudden, through His Spirit, working in my life, my family, um, through miracles and disasters and trials, that all of a sudden I cried out, God, where are you? Are you real? And it was sincere, and it was with the thought of, I really want to know if you're real. And then all of a sudden, he became real. When I asked him into my heart, and he gave me the Spirit. And it literally was like a window was just opened up, and everything began to make sense in this world. Until that Spirit is born again, it's hard to understand the things of God. Then we come to the planting of the garden. <clears throat> so again, God, verse 8, the Lord God planted a garden. I like, he's a gardener. <laughs> I love gardening. I don't know if you love gardening. I love gardening. Um, <clears throat> I love mowing my grass. I love grass that's green. Right now, it's, every time I go out to the courtyard here at church and we have some brown spots because we had some bad grass growing in there and I killed it all. I haven't had a chance to seed it so it's all green. So every time I go out there, I'm like, because I'm a bad gardener. You know, it, it's not totally green yet. And, and I need to really... Um, um, aerate the ground too to get to get to the roots and, and kind of get the soil soil loose so that the roots can grow more and the grass can grow. I know it's winter and things are going dormant, but I love gardening. And I think that God loved gardening and He placed everything where it needed to be placed uh, exactly where He wanted. So He planted a garden eastward in the in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. So He planted the garden and then He gave him a a gardener to tend the garden there. He places man ac actually right there in Eden. Now as we look at the, these geographical places, uh, one of the things I used to ask myself uh, is we need to find that place because there's gold there. There's jewels there. And boy, if we can find that place, we can find a lot of gold, a lot of wealth there. Well, you have to remember this is before the fall. And when the fall comes and then when the flood comes, this place is gone. <laughs> it, it was underwater all the sediment and land that moved and whatever else died, you know, just covered everything. So we have no idea where it is. We have a general idea, but it could be anywhere now as far as we're concerned. So we don't know exactly where the rivers were because they're all changed because of the flood that took place. So Adam's there in this, this garden there. He put the man there whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Uh, so there you go. He, he plants the trees there out of nothing. They grow. And from that point on, then the, the trees have seeds and the seeds begin to fall. And then you get more trees and more plants and so forth. And then they were able to eat it. God provided for their food. I mean, there's a question. Does God really provide for us? Well, he did for Adam. Does he do that for us today? He sure does. But if we just sit around and, and be lazy and not find a job, then how can he provide for us? Well, you're right. We have free will. And if we sit around and do nothing, then you won't eat. And the Bible's very clear. If you don't work, you don't eat. If you don't provide for your household, you're worse than an unbeliever, it says. So yeah, we need to work. And the work that we get, God provides for us. He really does. I remember when... I worked for my father-in-law and when I stopped working for him I was going to Mount Sac and I went to the career center and I said I need a job and so they got me a part-time job 
I was what they call a material identifier. And so I, I, I put together a stock room for the Energy Control Center in Alhambra. So I would take these boxes that were filled with electronic parts, resistors and transistors and ICs and all kinds of stuff, and I would identify them and put them in different boxes to create a stock room. And I felt God sent. And I was making eight bucks an hour. It's like, wow, back then, uh, 22 years ago or so, maybe 23 years ago, and from there I met this Christian man, Joe Corollis. And he came up to me and he says, Reuben, have you ever heard of King David? And I'm like, King David? Who's King David? He was in the Bible, King David. I'm like, no, nope, never heard of him. And so he goes to tell me, well, he sinned with Bathsheba. You know? And he tells me the whole story. I'm like, oh, okay, here, here's a Bible. Go read it. And that was my first introduction to Christianity. And so my wife and I, I came home, I said, honey, this guy gave me a Bible. I, I'm like, it's strange. And she's like, yeah, that's strange. Who, who gives out Bibles? That doesn't make any sense at all. But we read it. We read Genesis, Exodus, and then we got to Leviticus, and we ah, and threw it down. We just left it there. And he kept ministering to me off and on, and that was the seeds that God planted. He actually was instrumental in helping me get a full-time job there. I applied for a job as a, as a testman helper. And I thought that I had failed the, the um, interview. I failed it miserably. I really felt that. Well, he went over there and he knew the guys because they all know each other. And he talked to them. And, and he came back to me and he said, Reuben, you're in. And I'm like, what? And I went from 8 bucks to 14 bucks. And it was a good job. And shortly after that, a couple of years later, um, I accepted the Lord while I was in my company truck. Did God provide for me and my wife? Yeah. But he provided something even greater. And that was salvation through Jesus Christ. You know, I called him up when I accepted the Lord. And I, I said, Joe, I just want to let you know I became a Christian. And he, I heard him scream, Oh, praise God. He says, now I can mark you off my prayer book. Like you've been praying for me for all those years. I'm like, wow. So periodically I'd call him up, Joe, I'm an elder. Oh, wow, praise the Lord. Joe, I'm an assistant pastor. He goes, wow. You know, Joe, I'm a pastor of a church. He's like, whoa. And, and it's on his reward, you know, because he took those steps to minister and to share with somebody. A simple story. Do you know King David? No, I have no idea. And then pray, you know, and minister. I mean, it works because God is real. Yes, God provides. Uh, he's the one that planted the trees and it was good for food and they ate there. Now, did Adam have to work afterwards? Of course he did. And then he planted the tree of life. Uh, the next statement in verse 9 there. It was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, those are those trees that um, God warned them about. The knowledge of good and evil is a tree that he said, do not eat of it. Uh, the tree of life, do not eat of it. In fact, he removed that after they ate of the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil because the tree of life is the tree that if you eat of it, you live eternally. And he didn't want them to live eternally in the state of sin. It's funny because I remember reading this to the boys and Roman was just a baby, he doesn't remember this. But he said, Dad... When we read Revelation, there's a tree with different fruits. Is that tree of good and evil going to be there too? Because I don't want this to start all over again, you know? <laughs> I'm like, no, it's not going to be there. It will be a done away with. So, But yeah, that's the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they're told not to eat of. But it's there. And, and why does God put it there? Uh, don't you think it's like temptation, Lord? It exercises a free will, right? It exercises a free will. He gave us a command, do not eat of this tree. And just like he gives us commands today, do not do this, do not do that, do not participate in that. And even he gives us commands to do, go to church, be involved, get actively serving in the Lord. It's required. Oh, so much here. So, now a river went out from Eden to water the garden and from there 
its part and became four heads or river heads. The names of the first was Pisan. It is the one which uh, skirts the whole land of Havach, where there is gold. So if you find the place, there's a lot of gold there. And the gold of that land is good. Uh, Belium and oxen stones are there. The name of the second river is Gishon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hedekiel. It is the one which goes towards the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And so if you can find those places, um, you'll find a lot of resources there at the same time. You know, it's funny because Chevron, when uh, they read the book of uh, Genesis and they're looking at Noah and how Noah built the boat and he used pitch. And the pitch was literally oil. So Chevron said, wow, there's got to be oil in that area. So they started drilling in the area where they felt Noah had, had built this and they, they struck oil there. You know, so they used the Bible to find the oil. So that was a pretty interesting story. A type here, in, in the sense, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? This is where Jesus, you know, 2,000 years later, hung on a tree, uh, which would give us eternal life, which is good. But it will also take care of the evil uh, of mankind, the sin. Uh, Psalms 22 gives us a perfect example of the cross before the cross even existed in the thoughts of man. Uh, Twenty two six says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. I count all my bones. They took and they stare at me. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garment among them and for my clothing they cast lots. And so we have a psalm before the crucifixion even existed, before the whole death penalty by crucifixion existed, tells us about Jesus and how he was going to be crucified. Exactly describing what he would even say from the cross himself. Now we come through verses 15 through 17 as God places again. He's going to give us more detail here about man in the tree um, of knowledge there. Then the Lord God took man, put him in the Garden of Eden to what? Tend and keep it. And so there is our work. And so do we work? Yes. Yes, we're to work. The Bible teaches that we're to work. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of people that want the government to just uh, pay them so they can just survive and not work. When the Bible teaches that we should work. It's good to work. It creates a, a lot of positive things in your life. Values and morals and uh, <clears throat> fellowship and, and so forth. It makes you useful and not useless. And so to work, it's good to work. I believe in work. My dad believed in work. And I instilled that in my boys to work. And so I made them work. It's funny, I was visiting him on a job site and Modesto was telling the, the owner that my dad used to make us work. He would get out there and make us move stones from one place or other or dig a trench, you know. We put a four-foot trench in our backyard from, from one end of the trees to the other end to put manure in so the, the roots could go down into that trench easily and find water and nourishment. So I had him dig it by hand. You know, we were out there and I was with him and we worked every time I got home. Let's go out there for half an hour, an hour. And that ground here is so hard. And we had to dig as much as we could, water it, and then come back the next day. And we did it. And, and Modesto says, boy, I would have used a, a, a trench digger. <laughs> you know, just rented one and just got done with it right away. Yeah, I could have done that, but we didn't have a whole lot of money. And it's good to work. I actually like working. I enjoy tending uh, the garden and, and, and so forth. So... If you are a person that doesn't like to work, then you need to change that, okay? <laughs> you need to say, Lord, find me work and let me work for your glory. Let me work to glorify you, Lord, because you worked and so I should work. Uh, it, we're like Christ. We're like God. There's so much there. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Now, is he speaking physical death? No. How do we know that? Because they didn't die after they ate of it. <clears throat> he was speaking of spiritual death. And by the way, 
when you disobey God, you, in a sense, die to yourself. <clears throat> uh, sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death. And so when you sin, you're killing yourself. You're hurting yourself. When they ate of that tree, they died spiritually. And from that point on, the, the next children were spiritually dead. They were born that way. So when Cain and Abel came forth, and, and by the way, a lot of other kids were coming forth too. The Bible just doesn't mention it. Uh, Cain and Abel came forth. They were spiritually dead. And so they had choices to make. And that's where we get the first what? And we'll have a lot of firsts in Genesis. The first murder. The first murder. Not the first killing, the first murder. Where Cain, out of anger, first outrage of anger, kills his brother. Because God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. <clears throat> and we'll see that also. So they spiritually will die. So don't eat of that, God said, because when you eat of that, you will spiritually die. Adam. Now who is he telling? He's telling Adam, not Eve. Adam is the head of the home. Eve is going to be created from his side. Adam is to instruct his wife on what God has said. She has no idea what's going on at this moment. Look at verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And so he has instructed Adam to, to till the ground, to enjoy himself and eat of the trees of life. And, and, and then you can eat of all the trees except don't eat of that one otherwise you'll die. Then he realizes that I need to create a helpmate for him, comparable to him. Um, someone like him with the same free will, intellect, and abilities. And, and women do have the same free will, intellect, and abilities that man do as far as the mind is concerned. There are some physical abilities that man is superior in than women. And there are some physical superiors that women are advanced in, like having babies. Men can't have them. And so there's definitely a difference but yet they're both made from one another. But you notice here in verse 18 that she is to be what? A helper. A helper. She's a helper comparable to him. So, so she's to come alongside him and help him as he walks among this earth. And there's so much there. Um, let me read what Matthew Henry said. The, the Puritan Bible commentator best said it. The woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam. Not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to trample uh, upon un, uh, under him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved. And that's probably one of the greatest pictures uh, that we can have of a relationship between a man and a woman. So God created Eve to be a helper. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm running out of time. Let's go ahead and, and finish up here. Verse 19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And so he creates all the animals and he brings them. He brings them to Adam. So they all just came to Adam. <clears throat> and there's Adam sitting down and they're all around him. Snakes and lizards and buffaloes and horses and cats and all kinds of animals. Uh, remember, they're not eating each other. They're all vegetarians, even Adam eating of the trees and the vegetables. And so they're not um, attacking one another because sin has not entered into the world. So it's a perfect environment. And they're all buddies and friends and pals, you know, but they're definitely different than man. And so they're there around him. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So he named him before woman even came in. So you see how God is just describing each day a little bit differently here and give us more detail. <clears throat> and so you can almost imagine Adam. Oh, look at that. That looks like a orangutan. That's an orangutan. And that looks like a artifart. You know, an anteater. Yeah, that's an artwork. And so he's going on. That's a giraffe. And that's a hippopotamus, you know. And then by the end of the day, he's like getting tired. That's a dog. That's a cat. You know, that's an ant. <laughs> you know, he's just like naming them really quick at that point as he goes on throughout the day. 
But he wasn't satisfied. He wasn't happy. He was still missing something. And by the way, man alone, woman alone, will never be satisfied unless they're united. Now there are some that are gifted and in eunuchs, as, as Jesus said, and are called to be single. But generally speaking, God has created us for the purpose of creating, <clears throat> to multiply and to fill this earth. And God has a person out there specifically for us. And, and God is the one who has chosen that person for us, not us. We are to wait on the Lord. We're to pray. We're to seek Him. And we're to ask Him to bring us that person that we're going to live with for the rest of our lives. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. So He put him to sleep. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs. Now, some have thought, well, is it literally a rib that he's taking, or is he taking some organ? You know, what, what is it that he's taking? He's taking something out of Adam's side. <clears throat> uh, let's keep reading, and I'll, I'll come back to that. And closed up the flesh in its place. So he literally opens up his flesh, and he pulls something out. Here it describes a rib from his side. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. So he took that rib and he made woman from that rib itself. <clears throat> and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now that's interesting. So it had to be bone, had to be flesh. And so, yes, it's probably, it was his rib. Opened up his flesh, pulled the rib out, and created woman. So woman is in the likeness of man, created from man, by his side. <clears throat> they are very much alike and a part of each other. In fact, they are compelled to draw towards one another because they're made up of the same thing. That's why we are attracted to the opposite sex. And of course, the enemy is going to confuse that and and when we have what we have to this day, you know, love and, and it, it's not the opposite sex. It's just more of what you think love is <clears throat> when God created them this way. And so Adam's just like blown away. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh because they were one flesh. God separated them, but they're to join together to populate the earth and become one flesh. So what's the goal in marriage? To become one. That really is the goal. <clears throat> uh, I am one that does not believe that a husband and wife should be living separate lives. You have your friends, I have my friends. You have your bank account, I have my bank account. You do your thing, I do my thing. That's not what the Bible says. It says you become one. You're of the same flesh. When you start doing that, you start dividing. You start separating. You have opened up a door for the enemy to come in. You should be seeking the Lord together and becoming one. Trusting in God. Oh yeah, but I've got to protect everything I have because then they're going to take it from me. Yeah, that may happen. And it does happen. A lot. But we're to just trust in the Lord and move on and wait on Him to find us that person that He's called to be one with. <clears throat> Virginia and I don't separate nothing. Everything's mine. I mean, everything's ours. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking, okay? I don't know I'm going to get in trouble for that. It, it's, it's all ours. You know, um, the house, the cars, the pigs, everything, <laughs> they're, they're ours. We don't have anything separate. We do everything together. You know, um, she doesn't have friends that she hangs around with. I am her friend. I don't have friends that I hang around with. We both hang around you guys, and we both hang around the other pastor friends. We don't do separate things. We just learn that those things uh, bring trouble. And so we do everything together uh, as a couple, and we try to work together. We counsel together other couples. We were just counseling last night together, and our counseling is very much alike and very much pointed towards God. Uh, it, it should we complement each other because we both believe in the Word, and we're one in that sense. And so uh, I really believe in that. We become one flesh, one bone. 
And we are to leave our mothers and fathers. And by the way, that means that, means that you are no longer under their authority. You're to honor them and respect them. But now you are your own unit and family. You then begin to run and function as the part of the body of Christ as a unit. And, and marriage represents Christ and the church. That's what marriage is all about. Paul is clear in Ephesians, and you can read that in chapters 5 of Ephesians. So they, are both, they were both naked in the beginning. So again, no sin, no shame. They're running around naked, um, you know, just and man uh, and his wife. God married them. They became one, and they were not ashamed. It was a perfect environment for both of them. Oh, I want to touch on marriage so much more here. But so in this chapter, let me close up with some application here. <clears throat> when you see chapter 1 and 2, uh, you'll see that God created all these things to have fellowship with. He'll, he, he will be walking in the midst of them constantly. They will be serving him constantly. There's something to be said about serving the Lord. I just read an article, and I agree with it 100%. The pastor observed a family that was in his church, and he compared that family with his family. The family <clears throat> priority was the family. That was the center, the, the nucleus of their existence was their family. They were in church every Sunday. They, they sat in the pews together as a family. They did things as a family. They weren't ever separated from one another. Good values. Good thing to do. <clears throat> he had asked them at one point, why don't you come out on Wednesday nights? And they said, because Wednesday night is our family night. And he said, okay, well, good. I mean, all right, you're not here, but okay, you have family night. As he asked them, why didn't you send the kids into the nursery or into the school, you know, our, our church schools for them. Well, we like to sit together as a family. Okay. They weren't really involved, but they were there regularly. And they seemed to have godly values and believed in the Bible and Jesus. Well, when they grew up and went to college, the kids didn't get plugged in. And they fought, fell away. They didn't um, get plugged into a church. They didn't serve. And they were no longer walking with the Lord. And he thought about this <clears throat> as he looked at his own family's life. And I, and I agree with this aspect because it's exactly what I did. He said he didn't do devotions all the time. He struggled and, with the kids and their relationships. But one thing they did do is they served the Lord together. They made the Lord the center of their lives. And so they served God. Him, his children were in church and they were helping other people. They were feeding the homeless. They were involved in whatever events were there. They were participating. They were deeply helping and getting and catching and understanding it wasn't about self and my life and I'm the center of it. It was about Christ being the center. And he said when his kids grew up and went to college, one of the first things they did was find a church to get plugged into and serve. And I agree with that 100%. When you make Christ the center and you are serving Him and taking the emphasis off of you instead of you being here, putting Christ first, then everything else surrounds this. As long as it doesn't interrupt church, as long as it doesn't come in the way of church, as long as it doesn't uh, stop this from happening, everything else eventually will deteriorate. And I did that with my boys. We served we didn't just go to church. We served from day one. Uh, I got involved. I took them with me. We started serving. We started cleaning the church, cleaning toilets, uh, cleaning classrooms. Uh, we got involved with the ministry. We had the Bless and Be Blessed, which was a food ministry. They would help us collect the food. We put it in the pantry. We put them all in order. Uh, we created shelves so that they rolled down, and we put the new ones on top so that we'd get the bottom ones and give them out. We went to houses together. We gave the food to them. They were involved. As they were growing up, yeah, they struggled. Yeah, they're teenagers and, and they have to make their own choices. The free will comes in and now they start making their choices. Some of them walked away for a period of time, but they came back. And I can 
proudly say by the grace of God that they're all serving the Lord because they understand that they need to be plugged in a church and they need to be serving. And they're all saved. And it is the eternal security of someone's life that we should be concerned about more than anything else. And if it's not just your own, which I think you should be very concerned about whether you're going to heaven or not, it should be for your kids, whether they're going to heaven or not. Because what you do as a parent, it will reflect down to them. And if you don't serve, guess what? They're not going to serve. And they'll go off and not serve the Lord or know the Lord. And you've lost them for eternity. And so we need to think about those things. God walked among them and wanted to keep them at that point. But they, through their free will, fell. But God still provided the opportunity to walk with him. And he still provides that for us today. So some application, keep serving the Lord. <clears throat> Put him first. Make him the center of your life. God will take care of everything. He will take care of everything else as you go through life. Uh, I know, because I counsel quite a few people. And when they don't have Christ in the center, that's why they're having all the complications in their life. So keep him the center.